I'm going by God. And as long as you stuck with me, the seven. Stuck with me, that's fine. Okay. All right. How about we go all night? Uh, if you want, you want to go first, and then go high, and then pause. Does that sound good? And then we really like snappy meat, whatever. Sound good? Uh huh. Okay. Do I need to send you the link? Or do uh, you want to just draw it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's on Mystics is on fucking Spotify. Yeah, it's a hot you with right now. Mystics. I dropped it in the exact. What do you think of like house? Oh, we just went over there. Troll. Are you so troll? I'm, I, I, yeah, every game I start playing. I literally just had a game where I shattered and I got life grip. Uh, yeah. sure. Because he thought I needed saving when I was swinging on the shattered from no, whatever. I'm so mad about that. Alright, you ready to get started? Well, that was you. That was you. That was the law. The law of physics. Oh, fault. got it. This is a good. This is a good recording so far. Oh my god. <laughs> That's a word. Where's the where's the where's the link to the zoom? Check this sword. I'm checking this sword. Is it currently uh, I think so. It, it's currently recording, right? Yeah. We got the epic fall on yeah, camera. Yeah. Ooh, the fall of GCS. <laughs> okay. No. Oh, oh, you can do it. Wait, can we make that? Want it? Okay. Speak up. Okay. So we're recording this. Let's do it. Wait, unmute. Wait, can you turn your mic? Why'd you get a haircut? I didn't. If we can hear it. I muted. You got a haircut. I know that. Uh, otherwise, just make sure we can hear it. You can get a haircut. You watched it. Uh, hello, I'm watching it. Are we recording it or are we not? Yeah, hang on. We could, we could. I think, I think it's gonna. It's recording to the clouds. So it didn't matter like locally what I said. Right. So make sure. Right. Yeah. Right. Let me know when I can begin. Uh, right ahead. Cool. All right. I forgot to put my name on the damn slide. That's okay. Uh, name swap now. Uh, today I'll be monopolizing your time to talk about the Google narrative. And why you should care about it when in a game. Uh, for context, having spent my time in UCS, I mostly write for stuff, which is why I care about this. So now, just to break down the words so we know what we're talking about. Ludo narrative. Ludo comes from the word mythology, the study of games. Narrative from narrative, the word that means narrative. And together, what these both mean is what happens when gameplay meets storytelling. Um, that's the high level gist. This word was first really coined way back when in a blog post when someone was uh, basically insulting a game for saying that, hey, I think that the gameplay is at odds. I think it was Bioshock, yeah. The gameplay is at odds with the way the story is presented. The story is all about selflessness, but the gameplay like values just monopolizing resources, collecting them to yourselves, and therefore there's a ludo narrative dissonance. Very fancy word to say that story and gameplay do not go together. Um, ever since then, that word has basically been sort of appropriated time and time again, either to say, hey, I love Dead Space. I love how the game really makes you feel like you're in the world of Dead Space and that the gameplay service that the story is trying to tell. Or it's been used to insult games without people actually understanding what the word means. We are here to set that record straight. Um, and we want to ideally discuss when and how these things work together and like when they don't. So before we go any further, I just want everyone to know a story is not just you know words, dialogue, and stuff like that. You know, you know, there's world building that is implicit in uh, any real any real piece of media that comes our way. So I would like us to take the time, you know, fade out those things, reflect, uh, and see within this canvas what falls to you, you know. What you can really visualize, what you can understand from this screen. Uh, so now, 
Uh, uh, just visualize, thank you. Uh, for the watchers, uh, don't worry about it. It's just a so I'm just going to be using, you know, accessible game among us party game as a little case study example to sort of dissect this. Oh, no, the camera's dead. No, do anything. Okay. No. Laws of physics. Spontaneous falling over. <laughs> I've tried, but it doesn't want to. So. Mm hmm. Beautiful. As the camera yet recoils from another Among Us reference being within the club, uh, I felt continue on the same. But I hope that you all indulge me in like actually having a serious discussion of this game instead of it just being like a meme, which it kind of is. So, for context for people who do not know what the game is, it is a party deduction style game where you, as a bunch of teammates and an imposter, are set on a spaceship deep in the expanses of space. You are alone. There is only you and your fellows that you work with together. But you know that one of you has intention, or more than one, depending on how you're playing, uh, have intentions of essentially usurping the rest of you, killing the rest of you, and leaving you for dead. Um, on the surface of it, this is a pretty somber topic. Um, I think that the game drew inspiration from stuff like The Thing and you know other horror media where there's always a general sense of dread, unease. And you honestly notice that a lot in the way the story is framed, uh, set on a spaceship, a spaceship where there is no escape whatsoever. You are only confined within the bounds of the walls where you operate, um, and you know there's space beyond, and there's only the people who have to trust around you to work with. Even when at the beginning of the game, it is very much implicitly stated, one or more of you is the imposter, and you know have to weigh that back in your interactions with people going forward. And if we consider, what is the gameplay of this, uh, how does the gameplay of Amokus uh, service uh, this actual high level fancy goal? Well, there's just killing, you know, that's just the imposter job. They kill, they disrupt. But if we look, up, look at it from the crewmates point of view, um, we have to consider that most of their time spent in the game, other than the actual uh, social aspect, social element of it, it's spent doing various random tasks, the types of which we don't actually understand what really they're for past a certain point. We're like, yes, we are connecting wires. We are assembling a gem back together. We are detecting anomalies. Do we know what the heck these tasks are meant to do, like in the greater sense of the ship? Not really, right? We only understand them as, yeah, these are tasks that these strange little alien creatures have to perform in order to survive. And once again, these tasks have created a sense of distancing yourself from actually understanding what is going on. You are in this strange alien ship. You're working on tasks you don't quite understand. The only thing that really grounds you to this place is the fact that you know that the people around you are going to come, mostly. And in that sense, you notice how the gameplay and the presentation of Among Us actually you know, work with one another in a proper sense. As a crewmate, you are constantly bombarded with the feeling of there are things to do, there are things that must be done. I cannot actively process what is going on around me because you are always overwhelmed by the fact of either there's a task that needs to be done because someone has done something wrong, or I cannot trust what is around me. There's always a constant sense of peace. And for the imposter, it is a constant and booming sense of power. You have, you are as like the supernatural creature out of everyone. Like the thing, you are able to assimilate, but more than that, you are able to disrupt with remarkable ease. You are able to kill, and even then, you have social acuity. In when it comes down to the discussion section, you can lie, you can point to other people. You as an imposter have a lot of power. And all in all, this is you know a social game that has a lot of dread in the center. And when you look at it from this surface level of view, you're like, oh, I see. You know, I'm glad that they were able to impose such serious restrictions and like serious theming and restrictions into this game. Um, that being said, do we really need the game to be consistent with its tone? If we notice going on forward and forward, as more and more additions have been made to Among Us, I feel like at a certain point the creators realized, yes, this is the status of our game. People are enjoying it as a really fun social game. And more and more 
you see that the creators have strayed away from that initial starting point that they had. They've added more cookie mods, they've added more customizations and bets. Uh, they've added maps, I believe the Henry Stickman uh, uh, Stickman series maps, which is way more colorful, way more bombastic compared to the initial sets of maps that we were given. Um, and all this begs the question of like, are they betraying their core goal? They, they started out with this mission of dread and you know, their gameplay and their narrative was servicing each other in order to create this tense atmosphere. But now all of a sudden they're adding vectors and customization. Um, this is where the third aspect of the Ludo narrative, a fact I don't think is really discussed as much in the discussion of the word, um, which is we often talk about the artist's intent. We talk about what they're trying to say, but it is very, very important to understand how the people perceive the thing you presented. If you've come up with this brilliant, beautiful work of art, but people just see it as a comedy, that's how people are going to remember it as. Uh, if you all know the classic The Room, uh, iconic cult horrible movie of fame, you know, it was not made to be a comedy. It was made to be a serious drama, moving, full of like, full of tense moments and familial strife. But then in the end, we just remember it for being a really funny movie that's just bad. And it is very important that we remember the cultural perception of how our games are received when we are talking about stuff like the Ludo narrative, when we're talking about gameplay servicing the narrative. In a game like Dead Space, one that is, you know, seriously acclaimed and has created this era, era of being tense and that is being taken seriously, then you can get away with doing things like the diegetic menus, uh, stuff like, you know, the way you interact with the world in game, actually making sense in the world and people take it seriously and are affected by it. In a game like Among Us, or you know, in some other Jackbox social deduction games that are set in space, there's a surprising amount of them. Um, you know, the initial premise always starts with you know, there's a lot of dread, there's a lot of confusion, but more often than not, they have to start making compromises in the way their game plays because they have to recognize we are still a party game genre at heart. We have to cater to that, you know, cater to that expectation that people are going to have one is one is like very. I'm glad we have such live audience participation today. Uh, a few other considerations. I mean, we could go on and on about case studies of different games that have succeeded or that haven't succeeded uh, in this mention of the Ludo narrative. Uh, for example, uh, Last of Us 2 spoilers incoming for those who care. Please cover your ears. Big game to spoil. I know, it's a big game to spoil. Yeah. But a lot of the games, fundamental themes come around revenge and forgiveness. You know, that is one of the core themes of the game that you know comes to a head in the climax. However, that is very good and all if you neglect the hours of gameplay that have happened before that game, where you're shooting and killing unnamed people because you know they are not the main characters that we need to worry about. They, they have not been given that special NPC treatment, and therefore our morals can be a bit lax. It's like playing GTA 4, where they say the objective is to get away from the life of crime, and you've been given a gun and infinite tank cheat codes, and you're saying, have fun. Your gameplay is at odds with the story you're trying to tell. Um, and it's important in times like this to understand what you value more and where you're willing to make your compromises like Among Us. Among Us chose to make its compromises in its storytelling and framing. They chose to say, hey, we value our gameplay. We know that the story is just a framing for people to have fun. And if people are having fun and this dreadful atmosphere isn't really supporting the energy, we're going to lighten it up because that's what the audience wants. It's an important thing in the perception of game as a medium. Um, but yeah, hopefully if you care about your story, you make your gameplay bend to make sure that, you know, they work together and they're not constantly fighting one another. And that's that also the point of your game. Games are art, art is complicated. Um, but yeah, uh, that wraps up my brief talk on the narrative. May your games have nice stories that people care about and may people play them. But yeah, thank you. Well, no. Yes. What's your take on Panarchica's story? Panarchica's story is a moving one in the sense that you move through the story as a, as a character. 
Here's the thing. If you look at Antarctica, right? Once again, if you go by this anonymous team study, a lot of the world building is, you know, there's a cutscene at the beginning, yes. But a lot of the world building is implicit in the way it's presented. You are literally fly, flying from a like ship to a blip. You are you are in air fighting, and that says a lot about the world it's set in, even without you having to say, this is a really spooky world where things like this can happen, guys. <clears throat> and in that vein, the game that you're trying to the gameplay that you're trying to provide action fits that energy of like this is a fantastical world where or a futurized world where things like this exist. It is high intense, yeah. high pain is intense, and <clears throat> both those things you know work well with each other because that's the way you're trying to frame this world. Now, if you are trying to frame this as a world of intrigue as well, there are really interesting mechanizations and things that are happening in the world, and your gameplay is just a lot of fast-paced shooting, you might ask to yourself, is this the gameplay that tells the story I want to tell with this? But I feel like in your case of Antarctica. The gameplay was what drove it first and foremost. You wanted to make a game and you wanted to make a story that at least you know said did not fight against the game and said, hey, this is a cool place where this game can happen. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in that sense it worked. Let's mm -hmm. say, so, well, what's your take then on Mad Rabbit's epic vegetables? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the question I have asked you based on Mad Rabbit's epic vegetables. Did the story come first or the game? Um, so at one point, the, the, the gameplay came first, but and then the story came first, which then helped the game. So it was like a, a positive feedback. That's actually very common in a lot of this production cycle. Where did you come up with the idea first and then everything follows? More often than not, one thing gets made, you're like, oh, I have a really good idea. What if? And you start writing 2,000 words on it. And you're like, well, shoot, the game has to accommodate these ideas now. And you start making changes here, there. It's an iterative feedback process. Um, this is always the case when you like start getting your toes, like dip your toes into the storytelling. Because when you start making the world, what you have done, I think, is a very common process. You started with an idea. You said, I want to make X type of game. And then you said, what story would facilitate that? Or what story would be fun? And as you were writing that story, you said, I have some cool ideas. And he said, those ideas should affect the gameplay. So now it goes back. Now those gameplay should affect the writing. Positive feedback. So I think because you are conscious of both sides of the process throughout the making of it, they work well together because the tone of both your story and the gameplay match. And you know, they have similar energy and they are not fighting against each other. They're composite. I want to offer my opinion. Go for it. Because you talked about like ludo narrative dissonance, right? Yes. And you said it as like a bad thing, which it really is, but I feel like it could be a good thing for doing it on purpose. My example would be Mad Rabbit's Epic Vegetable Quest, where it's really funny that you're doing like Angry Birds with these bunnies, but then it kind of clashes a lot with the story, where the story is like this epic quest to save the world. And I think that that clashing is funny mm -hmm. and like intentional. I, I am completely down with I was actually reading about Ludo narrative dissonance a whole 20 minutes before I came into this presentation. And as an informed viewer, I was seeing a couple of discussions about how, you know, Ludo narrative dissonance can be a good thing. You know, like it's usually framed as a bad thing, but it doesn't have to be if that's the point. Um, I, I personally don't think there's a dissonance in uh, Mad Rabbits because I think the tone and the slight silliness of the energy of like the story is. Like even if it's an epic quest, it's still like playing along with the energy of the game. The exceptions I would say are cases where like one of the characters dies, and like there are cases where like you have like the world in flames with Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are like moments in the game that make you really break from it, and like wait a minute, what the heck is the story trying to tell? I'm just playing an angry bridge game with cool mechanics and a gun, um, and so. It's those moments that you have to weigh and think, yes, and what am I doing this for? Is it worth it? Is the impact of this worth the trade off I'm going to get by breaking the tone of my game? It's art. Anything can work so long as you make it work and you can stay, stand by your decision. That's the beauty of it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think for the most part, though, Mad Rabbits is like one and one, like hand in hand with its story and gameplay. 
like there's a there's a certain buoyancy to the whole thing you know even if it's an epic quest you're like aha i'm refusing you we're gonna fight together and then you lunge yourself at like enemies and uh so on and so forth um but yeah are there any other questions or thoughts this is a free forum for discussion uh, but if not uh no thank you so much for listening and i'm glad you guys chose for me You have lost camera privileges. Good. Alright, I have my tie and I present some stuff. I want you to like fill out this question. Cats. Dollars. Bread. Uh, wood. Uh, wood. Ah. <laughs> Forks. Knife. Chopstick. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. Forks. Elves. <laughs> now, a lot of people may think elves are the winner in this category. Just look at this. You live in natural environments. They can live with nature or construct from nature, make their own monuments, and just live peacefully in harmony. Like, there's not a lot of fantasy races that can do this. Elves are also able to usually do immense magic. And a lot of times in stories are the ones that are actually the ones. Uh, the people that first discover it, first use it, and teach it to others. They're also great archers. That's a stereotype. Usually it's worse. And a lot of the time they have ornate clothing, fancy, high, noble. Now, a lot of you, wait, what's my next slide? <laughs> That's just empty. I don't know why. Okay. And they also have a lot of named characters. I cannot pronounce it correctly. I'm going to say the first one. Kel He's the bottom of the sun, well, like Keltonis. One of the most powerful, like, blood elves in World of Warcraft that's able to use literally hostage's entire race's source of power. Legolas, from Lord of the Rings, really powerful elf, not as powerful as some of the others in the story, but able to hold his own. Um, I cannot pronounce his name, but he's from fantasy. He is known as the most powerful magician in his world in Warhammer Fantasy. Malfurion, also from World of Warcraft, a night elf who's known to be one of the most powerful druids in history. And the Wild Hunts from The Witcher 3, so powerful that they can time travel and they fox all of the Witcher story. But there is one issue about elves. They're worse than dwarves. A lot of the times, Every single elf character has fucked their own universe more than dwarves. A perfect example is if you look at most of these, the only one that's somewhat all right is Legolas because he's the only one that could actually work with others. Kelthanas was way too power hungry like most elves and had a noble and posh, posh attitude. Malfurion sucked while his entire kingdom was being genocided and fired by Sylvanas, who was also an elf. An elf that he ordered to defend when the Wrath of the Lich King expansion in Warcraft 3 was happening, and she died, came back, burned his tree while he just slept. This guy just ruined Witcher's three story. That's enough to say. And he's racist. He called the dwarf short sighted in the, a high end of war during the end times. And this is why dwarves are better, elves are bought, too no noble snobbish and a lot of the times racist so let's look at what elves have or dwarves first up environments look at this this is concept art for iron hole key if you know world of warcraft you know this place one of the most beautiful places in world of warcraft and a lot of fantasy and a lot of the times this is usually how dwarves live they instead of living with nature actually go out of their way to build stuff with their own hands instead of requiring some assistance from other nature and they actually don't find it which i think is pretty cool they're also incredible blacksmiths warriors they love to drink and eat and who needs magic when you know five millimeter but the thing is 
dwarves also have amazing characters in a lot of stories, unlike elves, because a lot of <laughs> elf characters fuck around and cause horrible stuff. Lanesh from the Aldari, the Drukari entirely existence. The wild hunt only exists because of that. Lord of the Rings, they created the rings, which caused the entire problem. A lot of issues are caused by elves. Meanwhile, dwarves, dwarf characters, help the main character and cast a lot of time. Brock and Cindy from God of War, they can craft all your weapons. I mispronounced it, but they're there along the journey and they help you. I don't know his. <laughs> no, no, I know who he is. I just can't pronounce it because Warhammer Fantasy has a lot of confusing names. He's the high king of the dwarves and was able to keep them safe from the whole ogre invasion, gnome invasion, goblin invasion, and the entire war of the elves and against the forces of chaos. This was also the guy that the high elf was racist to by calling him short sighted. He also has a book of grudges. He writes down everything you did to piss him off and he says, This is only the book. I still, I'm not good at that. So I'm sorry. But like Lord of the Rings helps <laughs> <laughs> the hero's journey. Murdan from World of Warcraft helped Arthas even warn against it and even tried to prevent the. What's the weapon called? I forgot. I feel really bad for I'm having to memorize a lot of stuff. But he tried to stop um, Arthas's weapon, which is one of the most iconic weapons in World of Warcraft. Cross thing? Is that what's called? Crossmore. Crossmore. He tried to destroy Crossmore before Arth um Arthas could attain it, even though Arthas was on the wrong track. He still tried to help him. He was a nice tutor and mentor. He's also one of the three Bronzebeard family who are leaders of the dwarves in World of Warcraft. I don't remember his name. <laughs> but <laughs> Witcher 2, when Geralt is recovering from amnesia and trying to figure out who he is, who helps him? This guy. And what does he ask in return? Just a drink. And the, what happens in the story? He just gets picked on because he's short, mostly by elves and like other people. But he is able to, but one thing that like, and also, Patrick, I think his name was, but he's the famous character in Warhammer Fantasy. Um, usually dwarves in Warhammer Fantasy that have the red maid, they're called slayers because the whole job is to die in combat. But he's so good at his job, he can't die. He works with one of like this human character, and it's kind of this like fun duo that they go around the world trying to solve stuff. But one thing that a lot of these dwarves have in common is when they need to help somebody, they will help them. Meanwhile, elves will point at you, laugh, and probably call you an insignificant piece of shit. Also, dwarves actually have games. Elves do not have a singular game that's like elf only. The dwarves, Dwarf <laughs> Fortress, one of the most popular games when it first came out, back in like before most of us were born. Deep Rock Galactic, an amazing, one of the best games on the market right now. And Hearthstone is literally, the tavern is literally owned by a dwarf that welcomes all people from all races in World of Warcraft. Do you think an elf would do that? No. So, exactly. <laughs> so that is my presentation. I hate elves. I think dwarves are better. Yes. What? What do you think we could do to solve elf on elf crime? And an elf on elf, elf on elf, elf, elf on not elf. Yeah. Crime. I mean, elf on elf crime. If they kill themselves, it works. Because a lot of times in fantasy, elves <laughs> hate. No, that's the thing. That's stupid. Elves are racist towards each other, even in fantasy. There's like wood elves, which other elves look down on, but wood elves look down on others because they're not a team of nature. High elves, which act like the majority of CMU students that look down on everyone. Um, dark elves, which are basically BDSM people, like BDSM elves that fucking hate the others. And it's like dwarves. Dwarves are like, oh, you're a dwarf? Let's go drinking. Let's go make something. And if elves kill each other, that's fine. If elves hate other people, then Kill them. Like, there's a reason why a lot of times in fantasy, dwarves work with people, or dwarves work with more people, or just other races in general, because they're not biased. I actually care about them, yes. What's your opinion on Santa's elf? That is more of a no. I mean, you're not uh, like a tiny elf. That's like fine, because they work on the stuff, and I'm pretty sure they're like slaves. You're <laughs> saying <laughs> on the record, you're okay with that. <laughs> What about do you like goblins? I mean, most of the time in stories, goblins and dwarves fight each other, but that's mostly because, like, 
they fight each other for territory. But like, what do you, what do you think about them? Like, I think they're kind of funny. Orcs. I think orcs are also pretty cool. It's, it's mostly they're like just, the bigger goblins. Yeah, and it's just orcs and elves and goblins and orcs usually just fight because territory. And that's like you know understandable because orcs usually fuck up their own territory. So would would you say that's like like more based or like more cringe? That's more based than elves because they're like, oh wow, our environment's fucked up. We want food. We want a place to live that isn't shitty, even though they mess it up. But then elves are like, oh, we need help. Oh, you you silly. This is a Warhammer 40k facts, but like they call people monkai is le- like it's not politically appropriate to call someone a monkey because they literally view humans as like monkai because they're so much older and more advanced. And even when they're in trouble, they're like, Oh, do you know you can help us? And it'll help you, like, definitely, sure. So, sorry. The goblin in there. Oh, no. so you like uh, clearly rate very, um. Like feel very highly about dwarves, but do you think that their hard to pronounce names go against like their likability? Well, that's the thing. A lot of times, dwarves have like amazing titles because this is also joking. More number fans do. There's this elf that has like paragraph long introduction, and then there's this dwarf that's just like, "Ye know who I am," and that's it. Yes. And why do you think it's the case that a lot of the elves you talked about they've been given? Rather complex characterizations, but every dwarf has just been a helper for the main guy. They're usually not, though. A lot of the dwarves have good stories. This was a good teacher and learning about how a student was falling to darkness and how he had to figure out do I continue trying to guide him, even if it. Because Arthas, let's just say this Arthas did nothing wrong, and he knew that. He was the only character that knew that, and he was like, I see the path you're taking is correct, your method is wrong, and I want to try and change that method, even if it means sacrificing myself, if possible. Brock and Sindri, they were helpers, but it's also because they care for the main cast and they have a deep in God of War too. Crack or not? Really good storytelling, these two. He points at a book and says, this is going to the book. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest, I didn't watch Lord of the Rings, but I just know he does. Um, this is interesting, though, because throughout the Witcher series, because I only play Witcher here, but I know what happens in the story throughout all of it. Um, dwarves work with people because those are the only somewhat acceptable race that like actually accepts dwarves. Dwarves are very often looked down. You save him from a fight. That's the first time you meet him because he's getting bullied because he's a dwarf. And even though, and then when you talk to him, he's like, oh, I'm a human too because you're playing a hero. And you're like, oh, do you hate me as well? And then he's like, no, I understand that people have differences, which just sucks and you have to accept it, which you know, there's a bit of, um, you could say that about a bit of modern society, you know, but it, no, but it's really nice where he understands where the stereotype comes from because they just live underground and that's their culture and, you know, humans aren't very found or open to it, but he, he's welcome to work with them and even other dwarves throughout the Witcher work with Daryl and face discrimination, but they go through adversi- adversity to try and prove themselves even more. There's like over 10 books on this guy. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not doing that much research. But I, I know the main gist of it. Yes. Good. How do you feel about in fantasy media where dwarves are usually really greedy? Like in Lord of the Rings, in the mine of Moria, I think is they yeah. literally dig so deep that they like they found like a demon and hell because they were greedy and want more. The thing that, like, okay, that's actually very common in just dwarf culture, in a sense, like, that originated from Norse mythology because of, it's not Mimir, it's, it's all, I, I cannot pronounce it, but it's, do you know the story of the dragon and the ring? There, there's a, it's a big, no, no, it's a big Norse story of, there's these dwarves, and then, uh, in between is messy, but basically, this dwarf, really liked this gold ring, didn't want to let it go, and he eventually turned into a dragon. And that became kind of a story that dwarves would kind of tell their children, don't get too greedy, or else you're going to turn into a dragon. And I think that's nice, because it gives them, like, actual characters of, like, oh, even in, like, when they do messy stuff, or they cause mistakes, they're like, we need to learn from this, and choose not to. For the elves, they they don't give a shit. They're so pompous as fuck. And dwarves are like, oh no, we must do better to not be this. Because like, oh yeah, do we technically like genocide a bunch of people? 
it's very off for being worse, you know, fire spell. I think I'm not biased, by the way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of non what are your thoughts on elves that have been depicted positively in media, such as, like, I don't know, I know in a lot of magic gathering sets, elves are predominantly <laughs> not necessarily the most genocidal creatures. Yeah. That's actually what I brought up Legolas, because he's one of the few elves that are actually good in media. His only downside was the fact that, well, he was an elf, but um, <laughs> the fact that, like, what's funny is that the good elves are usually the ones that actually want to work together, aka they exhibit more dwarf behavior. Feels like digesting, but I don't <laughs> I know I'm actually like Legolas because he's one of the few elves that was not biased and unless they had to work together versus most elves would keep their attitude. Yes. So like if you were walking down the street, right, and you saw an elf, what would, what would your first thought be? My lawyer has advised me not to do this. What okay. games elves elf only elves and it's like two Hylians count uh, it's like a good just only elves game because I was thinking like most mobile or fantasy genre have elves and dwarves what about just seeing the deeper way well actually hey man you got a job it's not me you got the thing the models right? I mean, if someone else wants to give you more money, wait, wait, where, you know, wait, where? You can probably do a search for ads if you're not paying attention to it. You know, this, well, you like this, this talk was going to be this long thing about like networking and how everything works. And like, I just realized that talk was going to put everybody to sleep. Thanks to yeah. some of the other very good talks. So, this is not super entertaining, but it's basically just the experience I've had with Steelpunk over the last few semesters has basically been like being forced to build something that's really, really big and probably like deliberately out of soap for what you would do for DCS. But there were a bunch of things that I learned from that that I think I probably would never have learned otherwise if I didn't attempt something kind of that, you know, oversized. Um, so the goal with this is just to sort of communicate some of the interesting things that I learned that you may not have learned otherwise to sort of be practical, you know. And I think the practical thing on this scale is to build a small thing. You know, when you're building a portfolio, when you're in GCS, it's really important to just have a tight, clear set of goals, a game loop that can be completed within a certain amount of time, it can be polished. It just builds out that quantity of the resume, and each of those things look really nice because they're still going to make them really nice. But big games also force you to operate sort of at that edge of where you, know, you have to be kind of just so absurdly efficient because you have not a lot of time to do a lot of things. Um, so I think in particular, the things they forced me to do was like, not be much of a perfectionist. Like you just physically cannot. You can't. It's not possible. You will never get anything done if you care about every single element that you're putting in being like a pie's ball game looking good from all angles. And sort of forcing me to, you know, push quantity over to quality. And then that's not something I think I would have done if I was focusing on sort of smaller more accomplishments. Um, and especially, I think there are a lot of lessons in the software that sort of can only be learned in like reverse scale. Like I think especially when you're writing code. Like there's a lot of lessons that you learn by writing a big system that when you go back, having written that big system and, and write a smaller system, there's actually things you bring with you that you wouldn't have brought in the other direction. And I think that's true for games, where if you build a larger game, it actually teaches you things that no amount of small games would have taught you, especially with like being able to sort of predict the future. And that's kind of the goal of being efficient with a system like this, just like any art, big art project. You sort of have to predict where things are going to go and then sort of prepare before it's and I, I just don't think I would have gotten some of those things. So one of the biggest things was reusing art and, and just like pieces that I never would have thought of. Um, in particular, like basically there's only really like a character only needs a unique silhouette and like two useful noticeable pieces for it to make a good character. I remember originally I had basically hand modeled three totally unique characters for each of these roles. And I went back in the last couple of weeks and I remodeled like just this guy on the left. And I remember just adding that helmet. So like Steve in the chat was immediately like, this is so good because he responded to just that one component, even though literally this character is just this exact character scaled slightly in a couple of different ways, right? So rather than starting over, it was really just copy and paste this, this character and then edit it a couple of times and make a new character and then just add that one special piece 
which just sort of makes it unique, which obviously is redundant in the helmet in this case. Um, and that just, you know, that, that serves the utility. Even though if you look closely, you can tell it's just the same model that doesn't have a lot of talk going through it. You actually kind of benefit from that really cheap. Um, and then also weight function collapse, which is like just basically just throwing a little bit of probability and kind of little pieces so they don't show up every time. Um, like the pipes, if you just like add a little probability to that, so they don't always there, and they're just like on and off by a uh, by random chance. It just you know, multiplies that how much points to kill you. The other big thing was this kind of the same lesson in level design, which was like making everything handmade pieces. Um, it looks really good from like a presentation perspective, but when you actually get into the world, it's just not as interesting as having less handmade stuff, but just way more dense detail. Um, and having like, like this thing on the right, players responding way more to this on the left, even though this on the right is literally just copy and pasted cylinders thrown on the left and the right. But because there's that sort of perception of detail density, it just feels like a better space to work in, even though each of these are like beautifully handmade models by by actually Jason over there most of, most of this stuff. So yeah. Uh, another big thing that saved me a lot of time was procedural animations. We only have one animator and we have you know a billion different actions that the player needs to make. Um, and so basically by transforming as much of that as possible into procedural rather than you know handmade, um, I think uh, most of what we do would not be possible if we hadn't done that. I actually recently uh, unpacked CSGO's files just to see how they did like look animations and gun animations and like all that stuff. And literally the way it works in CSGO is they have a unique animation for every single gun and every single look direction and every single person. So uh, looking right slightly to the right, holding the SMG, looking down is this unique is a unique single frame animation. This is a unique single frame animation. This is a unique single, and then they just blend between all of those oh, based on things. So obviously that is not a practical solution, but is that the same in CSGO too? I yeah, I think so. I, I don't think they actually change any animations like this, or not much. And they added the leg animations, obviously, and uh, and all the same thing for like damage. When you take damage in CSGO, it's a unique animation for every single possible direction and every single part of the body. Right. And so that's something you can get away with in Valve constantly. Uh, a question, sorry to interject. Um, I haven't played CSGO, but if you play it, can you tell that it's a unique animation? So I'll sort of get into this in the, in the next slide, but I think really the answer is no. And I think really most of the time all players care about, in, in terms of the damage hit reaction, they just want to see something move. What actually moves matters not much. I think it's just they have an older workflow and now it's just a workflow, and they have animators who are just paid to animate all day and they can get away with doing that. Um, so yeah, I think in that case, obviously with the look animations, they have to be specific. So, but I but you know the price you pay with this is those in between don't look as nice, but pretty much at any stable spot, if you just take a picture, it looks pretty reasonable. You know, obviously this doesn't look fantastic. You probably would want the orange to grow up a little bit and make that look a little more custom. But I mean, you could do a little bit of that. So basically, all this is is just playing normal animation in the default state, and then adding this just extra layer of code to rotate bone and spine. So in this case, it's literally just rotating the spine bone up and down, like you can the look, a little bit left and right, and a little bit left. And, right. um, and this is the hit reaction uh, animations. Um, I'll just sort of play a little bit of what it looks like towards the end here. If you see when he when I actually hit him, you can see he just sort of flinches a little bit. Really, this guy just sort of just that little flinch whenever he takes damage, and I found that that worked because we actually had made handmade animations for head, or body, and leg. And the issue was that when you would full auto somebody, they would like reset going to that position, or if you had two people dealing damage at the same time, they would sort of flicker between the two. And just by doing it with like a simple physics solution, it just looked a lot nicer in most cases. And all the character, all the player really cares about is just seeing some motion. So I just don't know. Uh, and this basically all implemented is just a physics. There's a physics layer on top of this where there's two um, spring joints, and then you just add the spring joint motion on top of whatever the face animation is. So all the approach is basically just build a base layer of animations. And then add the extra stuff on top of it so that the animator is no longer in the loop and it's going back and forth. Um, and so let me actually do this in reverse now that I brought that up. I think generally, like the work with this is we have so many 
people doing a lot of different things, especially in the earlier phase. That it again, it kind of forced me to learn a lot of stuff about like how you optimize that. Because especially in the early days, I found myself spending a lot of wasted time on like that sync work. So basically, you can think of like a group of people as like parallel workers in like a you know some sort of program, and you want to minimize the amount of time you're syncing between those workers, and that's basically that's the wasted cost, right? Um, so that, that's kind of prevents you from scaling linearly across people. And so with the animator, it's the same idea. If I have to keep going back and forth and all oh, this doesn't affect procedurals aren't working correctly because of your animation, that just burns up so much time versus if I just accept, we'll just make a generic procedural system and, and the animator's out of the loop, it's just saving a lot of time. So I found there were generally like sort of two types of people. And to be clear, I'm not saying one's better than the other. There's actually cases where both are better in different situations. We want to do ratio. But basically, in, at this scale, you know, certainly works differently when you're being in the cases and stuff like that. There's sort of two different types of winners on the team. There's people who are sort of intrinsically motivated. They'll show up by default. Um, they will probably pick their own tasks because they're excited to work on it. They probably want to contribute to design. And they want to, basically, they're like the people who are excited to show up and go. Whereas there's the other type, which are generally more focused on one task at a time. And they probably require a little bit more of you keeping them engaged because they're probably not going to show up by default. In the, in the GCS world, where you're not paying people, you can't give people money to uh, show up to your game, you want more type A people than you usually would um, because you don't have to do as much work. You don't have to keep them in, on the line. Um, but you actually don't want too many type A people because then everybody is like sort of determining their own vision of the game. You get this thing called design thrashing where two people are working on two different designs and then those just cannot be, and you waste a bunch of time trying to negotiate those. I think when you're actually paying people and you actually have to do you probably want like, 20% type A and 80% type B, um, because type B tends to be better at focusing on just one particular thing. If you just have them stay in their lane, you're probably better at that one particular thing than the more generic. But yeah, I found that I found that basically if you, you sort of have to put people into boxes a little bit and treat them differently, and it, it was a little bit more efficient than sort of treating everybody the same. Um, and then this, I think, is just when you're, when you're working on any big project, especially game development, I think the biggest wasted time for me. Especially when you're working on a game engine like Unity or Unreal, the biggest time burner is like I'm trying to get something done and you just it's just not working and you don't know why the engine's not cooperating and then you can you can like I've literally burnt three whole hours doing nothing but just trying to like click buttons to just get this one thing to work that I know should work. Um, so I just the strategy I basically I honestly feel like it saved me like close to an hour a day. The strategy is just basically put a cap whenever I find myself in that situation. Say not not more than twenty minutes to spend on this. Um, and then at that point, I just basically come back to it the next day. And it usually figures itself out, or I'll just put closure a different way. And I don't, I'm just not stuck in that roadblock. Because again, when you're, when you're building at this scale and you're, you're independent, you just can't afford to be wasting time like that. So, and the other thing was just having shorter meetings. People, I think, when you're, when you're physically together in a space, you just don't really get that much done, I think. Um, so, just focusing less on working meetings and more just on specific aspects of meetings. And then the one last thing I wanted to talk about was sort of like a design thing of, what, what the actual advantages of working in this space versus working in a paid studio is you can basically do what's called, I like to call it switch based design, basically where rather than, you know, in a real studio, if you're pitching to people and there's money involved and there's risk, you basically have to de decide the design and then pitch it and then move towards that design. And if that design is bad, there's not a lot of wiggle room to redirect and throw things out and, you know, change direction because of that financial cost there. Um, whereas in this space, when you're sort of working independently, and especially if you've got very few of those type A design people, you can actually just throw things out and change direction completely. Uh, at the beginning of the semester, we had this whole class system that we were building. We poured a lot of resources into it. We had models for the assets. We had this whole program system for these abilities. And we just like, you know, a couple of weeks in, we realized this isn't working. And we could, we, we, we could afford to throw it out because no one's looking over our shoulder expecting us to do this. And that's something that a bigger studio just physically cannot do. That's why you get bad games, basically, because they decided beforehand, and then they can't change direction. They, even though, like, you know, they, they know it's bad. You release a game, you've played a game before that you release, like, we know this is bad. How do they release this? It's because just that's just how it works. So there's there's an advantage that you have if you leverage that, you can actually make some pretty um, and then the last thing is just like games of this scale, I think, versus like a smaller scale game like. You know, Flappy Bird or something like that. We're sort of we're sort of building the rails that the player is operating in, and they sort of just have a few little inputs that they can give, um, and you basically just decide what you want that experience to be. I think the beauty of building larger games, which are more closer to like simulations than they are to sort of games like board games, um, is that the actual fun, exciting parts comes from these sort of implicit narrative the players project onto the game, 
rather than the, the narrative that you've written out for them. And I think if you drive in that direction, sort of like trying to generate these implicit narrative moments, um, you actually, that, that's been the most exciting moments for us in playtesting have been those little things of like the little arcs of story where like, oh, somebody's really low HP, and the last one alive. They run between a bunch of different rooms. They, they find the one syringe that was in that room and they heal themselves and recover, right? That's that's sort of like the glory of it. So anyway, I think that's that's uh, that's the fun part of, of working in this sort of phase that you can't really get uh, working on a smaller, like one dimensional mechanical like, game. So yeah, that's my uh, sort of scattershot presentation. Not, not, not much of a core theme, but yeah. I actually had a question. Um, I actually like that. I really like the thought of the implicit narrative of like you know players who make their own stories. So I remember when you were being speak on it and presented, there was a lot of concept talk about you know like the world in its current stage and the kind of enemies and what role they play. When you are playing the game, uh, how often do you think you find yourself interacting with that lore, or is it just like a backdrop for people to do? Um, I think. For me, it's a very, very high level backdrop. Um, I think there are there are more like cooler element stuff that we want to add in, uh, but I think that's really secondary to just it being a space that you inhabit and the story really is just what happened to you in that game by the end of story. That may change with generative AI may make it more possible to actually have stories that actually write out themselves from the experience of an implicit narrative. Uh, but I think in the current state of things, you just just make the mechanics of the story more mm -hmm. right. Steve, did you want to know, or are you still working on this? Concepts can wait. I don't know. They can, yes. <laughs> I can go and start. No, no, no. Did you share it with me, or? Yeah, I did too much thing. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you? It was fun. It's when I did on it. But I didn't play it. Well, there's a reason I said played and not I played that. Do you guys see the speaking of? You can. Okay, so this is bad. You press, uh, press Windows P and then do extend instead of. What? Um, you press the window instead of and B. That way you can choose what gets projected and what that. Yes. Yeah, you see that? Extend. Extend. Many people are saying. Right? Thing and oh, yes, yes, yes. Many people are saying. Or I'll turn over these yeah. little shit. <laughs> but you don't have permission to. You might want to share that with us. What? No, this is fun. It says, it says like four things. I don't know, Max. You need to share yeah, it on your computer. It's good. Um, it's good. I don't see what the problem is. The problem yeah. is when you start playing videos and stuff, it won't let you play it. If you have those, so what? No, wait, wait, wait. you can do. You can even connect it. Go to your computer. When you click share, you will be able to enable permissions for anyone who's viewing it, and do that first, and then you can take an edit. The Hawaiian shirt. I make an editor. What is it? Uh, what called? Uber. 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 I'm Right there. I don't know how to use a mouse. Do you want an actual mouse? Where is my mouse? Do you want an actual mouse? We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> I have an actual mouse. Do you want it? We're good. Does it work? 
Okay, so or maybe it's not just to the actor. Oh, okay. That's crazy. That's crazy. Goes hard. Nobody is saying. It's like it's like three in the morning, and then he goes, "Many people." It's not. It's not a difficult. Very. It's not a difficult saying. So it's hard. All right, shut up. Shut up. Respect. There's a portal. Right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Who are you listening to? I'm not listening to anything. Hold them out of your damn ears. I'm waiting for my professor to join like the next 10 minutes. <laughs> He's not here. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome to something a little different from what everyone else did. So I'm talking about how good something is. Talk about how bad something is. Yeah, it's my favorite part. Um, and it's not exactly like the thing you're thinking. I'm not like I'm not crappy all over. Let's think of this more like a eulogy, but rather actually more of an autopsy. Um, I'm paying respects to something once bright and glorious that a flame called Slickgate. I, I wish to preface that this talk is not my thoughts, but rather a careful analysis via this textbook. So I'm not talking out of my ass. This is this is actual textbook written by Tracy Fulton, um, game design workshop. So I'm not making it up. That's I wanted to preface that. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, um, this I'm just showing you what this gameplay is. Quick, is I'm sure you guys know what it is. But I'm gonna show it anyway by principle. I put it here as a slide. Okay. Um, so basically, it is a. It is a arena shooter based off of Halo. That is, they had a portal. Right? That, that literally the whole, let's look at the website, but that's what it says. Gameplay is actually very similar to the trailer. Um, so it looks like we for real. Oh, also they removed that map. That map is no longer in the game because there's a bug with it. Go to the next slide. Damn. That's not the next slide. That's not the button I pressed. I pressed, I believe. Okay. All right. <laughs> why why do this? Why why talk about this? And I and I think it's it's simply because it's an interesting subject to talk about. It. On surface, and even underneath. Splitgate was a great game, a great premise. It's just super fun, polished actually, even by beta. Um, satisfying shooting um, and little to no bugs. Okay, let's let's give it some credit. Innovative gameplay. Most importantly, it's it was new. It felt like you know, and it was released during the pandemic. Well, at least the beta was, and it felt something new and fresh. People finally had something new to play. And just smashing two ideas worked. 
even to find an esports category. Um, so obviously, if you look at the graph, it doesn't make much sense based on what I just said. It, I don't think this is unknown to most people, but it had its time in the spotlight. Just you probably didn't expect it to be as abrupt as this was. Is that a full two years after the news? That's correct. This I took, by the way, literally last week. This is a screenshot I took last week. It has less than thousand, a hundred, no, a thousand. Yeah, it has less. <laughs> you know, you the math. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, the peak is more than a hundred times its current amount of players. So something must have gone horrendously wrong. Something must have. Um, that's what the basis of this talk today is to look at exactly what went wrong um, according to this book. And let's start with the simplest, possibly the most important part of game design, something that has carried me very far. But, but, yeah, this is that game should be fun. Right? This is the many thing that a lot of people forget to do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Not something I came up with, but it has carried me very far. Um, recently, though, I've decided that it needed a better edit, and it's thanks to this book. Is that games should also be accessible as well? Because this is distinction exists because an inaccessible game is no longer fun. Okay, all right. This is what English teachers would call uh, a thesis statement, I think. Um, so let's just break this down. This is a pretty bold statement. Um, I think you guys would agree. According to Tracy Fulton. These are the subsets, what will be considered fun and acceptability in a video game. So you don't have to read all this, it's a big list. <laughs> um, so for the purpose of the talk, we can ignore a bunch of this stuff, uh, either because it doesn't apply or it's something they did well or not as egregiously. Okay, so these are the actual six reasons that they all went to crap. Exercising difficult skills, stimulation, making interesting choices, micromanagement, stagnation, and a sixth surprise variable that does not pertain to any of the lists that I had before, but nonetheless had a significant impact. Um, try to guess what it is. Do not raise your hand. No, I, I, know, uh, I know the answer. I do not want you that, to answer. That's Ludicolo. <laughs> <laughs> Just a mystery Pokemon. I have no idea what this is. Uh, yeah, good job. That that was exactly right. Thank you. Um, all right. These, so these are the six reasons why. Yeah, which is really so exercise these difficult skills. Um, so raise your hands. Who has climbed a set of stairs before? Um, wow, many people. Are saying, um, right? So then you understand this. When you learn something, you take it one step at a time, and that's what difficult the exercising difficult skills means. It means that when a player is allowed to learn a skill gradually and master it, while being rewarded for doing so. Fullerton additionally adds that presenting your players with the opportunity to learn skills is a challenge, but it is a hollow one unless you provide ample opportunities for them to master and display that skill. It is also equally important that learning a progression is entertaining as well. Fullerton states that rewarding the player for sticking with it will make the process enjoyable. So how did Slipgate violate this principle? I'm going to show you two clips, both great plays, both of them netting a ton of kills, which is the ultimate objective of the game. One of them being a pro player, another them being a plat player, which at the time it was recorded during the peak was the average skill level. And I want you to tell me, after I play these two clips, the biggest difference between their plays. Skill. That that was obviously the pro player. Uh, let me show you what the average player plays like. <laughs> I 
Oh, So, you know, what did you know? Obviously. Are they playing the so didn't the second guy get more kills? It's a different game. Do you want to answer? So basically, the pro player has the uh, Just a good simple answer. They didn't use portals as much. They only used it. That's correct. Okay. All right. A lot of you guys said that too. All right. So yeah, you're right. Um, and that's the thing is that most of your skill in split gate is attributed to the most innovative part of the game. Charge the portals. I heard you guys just said. I thought I was just shooting. So going back to the quote unquote definition of good skill progression, we can probably say that it exists for sure. Uh, and you're rewarded for mastering it uh, because you saw that one of them was much more efficient than the other one. Um, however, as I've just shown, skill in Splitgate is very binary. You're either very good at the portals or really bad at the portals. So why does this contradiction exist? Because the second part of the definition the skill the progression is hollow if there's no ample, ample opportunity to master that skill. Okay, can you can you can you freaking go to the right? Can you freaking thank you, thank you. Uh, you increase your skill very slowly, and there's never never any noticeable di uh, difference, and it's generally unrewarding. Eventually, though, they'll hit that plateau right there. Um, and they'll find that they hit a wall in terms of in terms of skill, because that this fourth section is pertaining. After you learn all the game mechanics in terms of running and shooting, you find that learning the portals in this fourth section is incredibly difficult. And during this progression here, eventually you'll find out that, hey, I don't need to use portals. There's, there's no need to do so because you're not being rewarded for getting. Fancy kills, you're just getting rewarded for kills. And it, this leads to the game feeling um, less approachable because you feel happier when you get a kill without a portal than trying to use a portal and dying because of it. Um, and the most fun, casual way to play the game is therefore to use to play without portals at all. But then, then that begs the question why play this game at all? move away from game design for one second and let's talk about stimulation a game that stimulates your senses is fun um and that's what fullerton said and i agree i'm going to play split gate and halo infinite for just a split second um and this is a fair comparison by the way because split gate is literally uh, marketed marketed as um a halo oh. um <laughs> it's true look at the website um, my contention, obviously, is that Splitgate does not stimulate your senses as much as they probably should. Let's take a, let's take a the, look at these two sound clips. One, both of them featuring rocket launcher type weapons. And you know, just, just pay attention. <laughs> uh, there's no fucking sound. There's no sound. Oh my god. I heard, I heard the sound. Oh, you heard the sound. Heard That's it. great. That's great. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I didn't hear the sound. <laughs> uh, yeah, you hear the sound? As, you can, as you probably can see, Split Gate's sound just isn't as good or isn't and isn't as polished. Split Gate's sound a range of sound effects are also very limited. A lot of the guns ma um, all manage to kind of sound very similar. In addition to this, there's barely any music. Um, there's no, there's no lobby music, there's no pre-lobby, post-lobby, there's no pause music, there's no in-game music, um, and Halo has all of that. And uh, yes, the gameplay, both are very silent, but in the end, there's still victory themes of that and defeat theme. Not much that, even still, after, you know, a whole two years after release, it's still not in the game. I played it myself. I've got like 10 hours in it. 
Um, you know, you could say that this is all nitpicking, you know, you could say that I'm just like cherry picking these examples, whatever. I would agree with you actually, because yeah, it's a very subjective sound. It's a very subjective thing. However, however, I found this image when I was trying to do research for this talk. I didn't make this image. I found this image on the Slickit subreddit of 68,000 people. This was one of their top posts of all time. Uh, clearly, I'm not the only one that thinks this. The lack of music simply makes the game feel empty, and there's just no simulation. This can halt the momentum of the game and simply make the game feel dull and therefore not fun. All right. Would you rather eat turkey bacon or fake crab for the rest of your life? Don't, don't answer. But that question probably got you thinking. Maybe you were intrigued for a second. Okay, there I said. Sid Meier once said, games are an interesting series, a uh, series of interesting quotes. Obviously he's right. Not all those civilization games that vouch for him. The textbook additionally adds that these choices must be meaningful choices. And a meaningful choice must have consequences. If they do not have consequences, then the choice is arbitrary and merely a distraction. So how does Slickgate fail this? I'm going to turn to maps because maps are the ultimate decider of what the range of this decision can possibly make in the game. And I'm going to focus on the 12 arena maps because they're the ones that the casual players were playing most of the time. Um, essentially, a large portion of maps have a very restrictive play style. Think about like a strong current. You either go with it or you drown. Um, the shoehorn gameplay would obviously limit the amount of decisions you can make. Let's look, at, let's look at this example right here. This is the high winds map right next to the little middle of the map over there. Say you're looking for enemies to kill, which is a very common, common scenario. How many choices can you possibly make? There's only one. You can only go down to that door at the end of the hall. That's it, because you can't go, with, go back to where you came from because you know there's no enemies there. And you, there's a portal surface to your left and over here, but you have to have a portal surface already available to you to, to portal to. Uh, for a room that's situated in the middle of the map, it's just not interesting enough. And here's Halo Infinite again. And this is an arena map called Recharge. This is a small room right next to the middle of the map as well. But notice how the big difference is that there are two options the player can make in this room. You can either go down the ramp, or go to the right into another room. And just and this just means it's more interesting to play. More freedom of choice also means you will get to play the play style that you want to, instead of forcing you to learn how the map flow works. That way you actually feel more in control of the game and therefore more fun. So does this does this room have three entrances and exits and the other one only has two? That's correct. Okay. Because you, you entered this, you entered this right when you entered. All right, so maybe you've seen this guy before. Um, if you have, I love you. Um, micromanagement is considered a part of the group of fun killers, according to this book, in terms of gameplay. Sometimes games give players too much of a control over minute detail, and it becomes tiresome for players to micromanage. That's what I mean. Um, to quote the textbook, micromanagement takes place when a task becomes repetitive or tedious to the player. Excuse me. Then it takes away from the game itself because you're too busy. Well, micromanaging. Those gosh darn portals again. I mean, um, you need four keys to use your one special ability. Not including constantly remembering where your portals are, remembering where uh, your enemies are, where their portals are, where your teammates are, where your teammates' portals are, and then you can where you can shoot your portals, where you can't shoot your portals, where all the gun pickup locations are, where the high ground is. It's too much for a huge player which is a large number of that 68,000 people. Um, too much management does not breed fun. Instead, it breeds, um, it instigates frustration. <sighs> and I hate to do this. Compared to Overwatch, for example, I, the most times a complicated ability need only one click, one button to execute. This means that a player can spend more time thinking about the consequences of their abilities what could happen after they use their ability, rather than using having trouble executing them in the first place. The game being more accessible uh, leads, leads to more flexibility for the player, which can lead to more potential fun, 
because the player often wants to have different experiences from the game itself, which is what most of these other games are listed that allows them to do. We're almost done. There's only two more of these to go. I, I promise. Uh, stagnation essentially incorporates everything people may call boring. There's a large part of those fun killers, as the book states. Fullerton adds that stagnation is, is where nothing new seems to be happening over a long period of time, and choices stay the same level of importance and impact. For Splitgate, this factor is the result of everything I've mentioned before. Nothing new happens after a few hours because of a lack of content, lack of guns, lack of maps. Honestly, these are excusable, but the lack of gameplay change is not. Each map feels pretty much the same. You just really shoot people. There's nothing new. No matter the game mode, even if the game mode switch swaps your loadouts, whatever, it doesn't really matter in the mouse case because you're just shooting people. In addition to this, the portals stay at a similar level of impact to an average player because, once again, they don't use them because there's no need to use them. And this makes the game not fun because, well, there's nothing fun happening. So this is the sixth reason. Um, so the plus, uh, developers, and this calls back to my, uh, my subtitle, by the way, which if you understand the reference, I love you again. The developers didn't really anticipate 68,000 people to play their game, which is understandable because they're a very small group of people as an indie game. But 68,000 people, they came. Then, and their servers couldn't hold that many for obvious reasons. They had to constantly expand their servers, which took a lot of time to do. Eventually they invented, uh, they implemented a queue to join the game, which also took a long time for you to get into the game itself. Um, I mean, clearly that's not very fun. Honestly, this is a pretty big reason, but not the biggest possible reason and not the biggest reason as to why that drop was so immense. Are you ready? <laughs> you ready? All right. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Released on November 15th, 2021, with a price tag of $0. Fail Infinite have had a player base on day one with 272,000 players logging on. Rest assured that a large majority of players left Splitgate to play this new game as basically the same game that the game that we're playing before was copying. You can roughly see here <laughs> the hemorrhaging of players around the latter half of the year. These players never came back, even if Halo Infinite also kind of sucked. And, and I'm just gonna end this talk and this statement once again. Keep your game simple. Play test, play test, and play test. There's nothing wrong with more play tests. And play to Christ that a better version of your game that doesn't release a few months after yours. Take care. Sir, why is the why was this like two years? Sorry, because the graph you showed it was like a spike. Yeah, the release date was like like twenty nineteen. I would assume they had the the age they had. Oh, okay. I don't know. That's not the actual. Is that right? I have no idea. I didn't really care about that because that's not really relevant. The price is only put it up on Steam. So yeah, this is a game that really exists. Yeah. That would be weird if you know if it's some like. They just announced it in 2020. Could be the highest for Halo Infinite. Especially if that was like. What? What? Mr. Beast? <laughs> <laughs> That's why there was this like. Did you first play the game? That's kind of question again. I wonder, is it? I don't know if you thought about it, but I, mm -hmm. I wonder if it's. If, Part of the reason the plateau was so bad is it's actually not a plateau, but like almost like a reverse saddle point where like the game actually becomes harder using portals, not easier. Like if you don't, you don't actually get better, like flatline, like the game actually becomes empirically more difficult. That's correct. So in order to stay better, right, you would not use portals if you're worse significantly if you want to try to use portals. So you played a lot of like ranked modes, I'm assuming, in this game? No. But that clip you put in right? That wasn't me. No, you're talking about me? Well, I'm, no, I'm just saying a clip was. I guess it was, no, I didn't think it was the Okay, that was a rank, yes, that was a rank mode. So you played like, yes. 
did you use portals in them? I cried. Did, did other people use portals? Nope. So my reason I'm asking is because when I played, I was not good, but everyone used portals in my games. So I was thinking maybe it's like a like casual versus competitive thing. Because in casual, like we use portals and we suck, but like whatever, like we don't care. Right. But those are the people willing to put in like hundreds of hours to learn such a difficult mechanic because of the potential of it. But the thing is that for a new player, it's just extremely discouraging. And you, like if you're just playing with friends, which was a large majority of the 68,000 people. And what people that are left are all the sweaty tryhards, as they said. And if you're trying to win, it's actually not. Well, if you're just trying to have fun with your friends, yeah, that yeah. makes sense to me because, like, I wouldn't play this. Well, I guess that's what happened, right? People <laughs> didn't play this game because they didn't use portals, but like, I did not see that many people just shooting, which is probably just because I played in bodies where people didn't care. In terms of so of a solution, would you say like forcing them to use portals, like making it so that certain parts of them were only traversable with portals would help? I mean, my contention is that it was like they'd have to streamline the usage of portals. There's nothing wrong with the portals themselves, but the thing, the combination of it being really like the potential, the, the high scale floor and the high seal ceiling of those portals um, combined with its inaccessibility of its buttons and stuff, like making, removing the kind of difficulty with accessibility would have helped them trying to learn that more because they weren't being as frustrated as much. Um, rather, it would have been just another, like. like it would just be something else for them to learn rather than something they hated using, if that makes sense. I just wonder, like, no matter how accessible it is, just because it's such a familiar genre, it would be always easier for more people to just play it, like Halo or whatever, because it's such a familiar skills that they've already built. Whereas, like, you would have to force them somehow to be able to play it. It's hard to kind of pinpoint that without me seeing that happening. Um, but I was thinking that maybe they could have made the portal be its own gun for its third weapon. Maybe that would have been like you had to switch and pull out and then put it back. But that they would have been... made it like the portal gun, like middle mouse, and you just shoot a portal. Do you think the keys were really big? The keys are a big reason. It's four keys for one thing. Wait, what is? How does it? The the remove buttons are really like the like X and D. Like I do remember that being pretty like. Why, yeah, like why does double tap? Why don't or like be able to replace portal. Yeah, exactly. like, well, I think the thinking is there's a lot of strategy you can do if you can just like you have two portals up and I'm just moving that one specifically. Right, but if you but also the key again, so maybe they change. should just not have allowed that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's just I mean, what if they could have done? I mean, people just left the game too early. Like they just didn't have enough. There were okay. I did read a bunch of their dev comments because they posted on subreddit a lot. They had a bunch of weird design choices. Like they didn't want actual grenades being in the game, which to me was really weird because that would have been a great potential of extra content for them, just like throwing grenades. But they were like, oh, you could have been like one shot at people with grenades, but then they would have been worse than guns. I'm like, let people have fun, idiot. Like, you know, grenades sounds like it could have been very interesting. Like, would have been just fun. Like, it's like but they they pinned it to be such a competitively vi like viable game. I'm, sorry, question. Were there grenades in like potato? There was okay. The only grenade you had was the EMP grenade, which only the only thing it did is destroy other people's portals, which is not very useful as a casual player. You don't give a sh you don't give That's two rats. So many steps ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't give two rats and asses. Like it's just that simple. Destroy his portals. He can't escape. I know with the two seconds. All the grenades are just fine. Yeah, now everyone wants to solve a Rubik's cube to make a decision every time. You know, <laughs> in a live action. In a yeah, in a live fashion. In an arena shooter. Exactly. Question again. Uh, this is just a guess your opinion because I feel like now that we bring up competitive play. The, when I was interning as Sledgehammer, there was a certain discussion like mm -hmm. in the company chat that was just like, how much should we balance competitive viability with fun? And I mean, a good example is what is that Blizzard mobile game that was just like, oh, we're just yeah, here's yeah, here's a store. store. He was like, oh, we're gonna like yeah, stop supporting yeah. competitive, and we'll just instead make the game like wacky. And fun. Okay, but I feel like. This is Here's kind of an thing. example of maybe not getting The thing is that in terms of longevity and stability, fun will always 
be better than competitive. But is that really true? Like yes, yeah. Here's the strong. Games were created to have fun. I think you're the truth. Whatever you want. And it's it's possible to have both, but it's a hard balance. I mean, League of Legends have managed to do it. Well, it's it's not fun. Fun. Uh, it is the most fun game in the game. Okay. Legends is not. It's not fun. It's okay. not yeah. fun. It's it's fun. First off, off, the top lane role is useless. <laughs> that game. That's untrue. That it's it's mostly useless. I, I it's, it's not all useless. If you think it's tank, it's useless. No, well, then uh, it's, it, that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> I think I that it, okay. someone else had a question. So I, so I thought it was interesting that when we were discussing accessibility in those countries, we could get your use of micromanagement. That's what we were talking about. Yes. Overwatch was a bad example. Now, once we started talking about the actual key buttons, I think I agree, except for you know, that one hero that released yesterday. <laughs> no, but we don't. That, that did not make that before the. <laughs> but besides the concept of like the specific buttons you have to press, um, before I started playing Overwatch, I always thought that it would be like more of a micromanagement kind of game because there's so many things going on, you really have to know what each person does and where they are. Um, now that I'm playing, I mean, it's a little bit easier than I thought, but like the thing is, the core, of, the core of the game, a lot of the heroes are based on very simple capabilities, <laughs> right? Well, no, like we can go off of maybe say, sorry. It's um like for example like I don't know Reinhardt Winston like you just you don't have to know what they do you just know he jumps and he shoots you know if you have a shield like for like Winston just jumps and shoots his lightning gun like it's like the intricacies of the game depend on the consequences of your actions what things could progress. But because the mechanics are so simple, you don't like you can focus on that fact. That's how you learn, and that's more fun ultimately. So, so here the micromanagement that comes up in Overwatch is more like top level, but like a player could just pick up the game and like understand. right. Some heroes allow you to be mechanically intensive, like Genji, for example, right? But the thing is, is that you can choose not to play Genji, right? But in Portal, and, and also in Split Gate, like in Split Gate, you don't. You don't need to be like you have to choose portal. I'm sorry, Will. That's okay. I was just something to add is that I agree with your overall point, and I'm gonna disagree on the point about Overwatch specifically. And I think that it wasn't that accessible. Overwatch went out. And that's why that they, you know, when they made Overwatch 2, they had the whole like first time user experience thing. They added that so I think. Uh I, I don't know learn. when you played, but I was I'm a very biased player because I played since release. I've played oh, since like a year and a half afterwards. Okay. Um, but the just like I've tried to get friends into Overwatch, and they're like, I don't know what any of these characters do, and they're like, do it is okay. That do it was they did drop off the cliff um in the later years, but I am yeah, a little biased. I mean, late, I mean later. Yeah, and I they, do agree. And they did try to to address that, you know, yeah. make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's added, well, they like, removed the tank. I'm still sad about that, <laughs> but. Well, I mean, mostly that they like added the first time user experience thing. Like, oh, we're gonna have you unlock a character every few games and like tell you what they do. Yeah. yeah. That's my answer. More to it. Also, yeah. the abilities yeah. are very similar. Yeah. Shift yeah. and fusion yeah. movement means usually like that type of. We go on and on and on, but Blizzard did a very good job designing. Well, except for like well, no. you can shoot it's it's exactly well. because of. Uh, a lot of the time, no. yeah, League, League also does that. A lot of buttons do very yeah, similar yeah, things, like yeah, ease, always yeah, have movement ability. Yeah, that's a lot of losers do fall under that. That's correct. Yeah. Any more so other questions, concerns, or opinions? What are your thoughts on the heroes in the No, it's fine. Thank you, sir. Broadcast. Like, I, I'm going back to Joyce's point, I guess. Like, it's just like, I think competitiveness always can fall through. There's so much things like competitiveness can, can like, like has like, there's so many things stacking on top of each other. You can also just change the rules. No, like, that's but here's the thing. The mm -hmm. moment a game adds competitiveness into it, it's a sport. It's not like people watch it for fun. People don't play it. Like, how many people who watch football games actually go out and be like, I love football. Like, no, they just like watching football. 
but the thing about rule changing is that sometimes it just creates this dissonance between players and troll players, like between people who are watching it and people playing it. I don't think Smash for the players. Yeah, but, yeah. But, yeah. but I know I know League of Legends had used to have this discussion that they were gonna create this different rule set for troll play, but obviously didn't go through. Sorry. Who was their hand there? Oh no, I was just raising I, I like watching soccer for fun. Nice. <laughs> And it, yeah, I also like watching this hobby with fun. Anyone else want to tell me what they like? <laughs> Men. I actually like, don't like anything. Think anything with competitive, <laughs> you have to balance it between like, oh. Like, <laughs> like, I think it's so weird. It's What happened with like Doomfist when they're like, oh, you can't yeah. like, the bad players can't do it. We need to make it really good. Well, I've seen people be really bad at doing this. Well, yeah. But then, like, the, but, like, it doesn't mean at, when they're GMs, they don't take off your headphones. I think we're talking about it. It's just crazy. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's like, oh, if you, you died to this because you're bad at it. Yeah, because I was just saying, I know, I, I know a few doing this. Uh, we're very good at the game. But, uh, not very good at doing this. Yeah, I guess the answer to the question is more important. You have to choose three. Yeah, I mean, like, how do you mix that? I play that as a fool. I am. You know what? That is you I think we're about to see Yes, many people are saying this. I'm still talking. I'm still talking. I want to meet I said that I can order pizza. No, Like, you guys are too old for this talk. It's like my talk for this is BRA, not, okay, except yeah. GCS oriented. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. exactly. We're right. doing this. Yeah, most champions have that mind. Sorry, it's like, no, it's a it's a talk. Yeah. It's a seat it's a yeah. like your I don't know. Talk talk thing. Thing. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it is blinding. Oh, it's oh, it's oh. I mean, you can go to bed. No way. It's like, is it air generated? Yeah, I didn't do that. Good yeah. catch. Yeah. 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 All yeah. right. Yeah. So, so, so I am going to be lecturing as to how you can use your GCS experience to bend CMU and your career to your will. Will? Your early career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, Joyce has water stuck in the uh, bag. Oh, that's the PFA. I'm Matthew, you know me. So, but, but for Max, I have that on, keyboard. on Zoom, we haven't met. I am a senior. I do a lot of VR games and stuff. There's no one on Zoom. <laughs> Max, five He's still on the Zoom. Oh, hey, hey let's go. <laughs> So, uh, disclaimer, this is from my experience. Anything I tell you may not apply. Uh, number four, <laughs> I had a 112 term project, and I was like, and they were like, you should use Python. And, but yeah, exactly. But they also mentioned that some people use other things before that's not Python. So I got thinking about that. Are you British? Yeah. Wait, what? So oh, Python. Yeah, yeah, why you just <laughs> Python does not rhyme with Python. <laughs> so, so I was like, I want to have it be in VR in Unreal, and I'm going to use GCS to help me make the projects. And Tosby was like, so it happened. And then it became fantastic with the lights. And then I got it exhibited in the museum here. Is that something? No. Oh. I think that's like that. Number three. 
So <laughs> you can do cool things, right? There's GCS grants and there's like FERFAP grants. For some reason, the FERFAP, so FERFAP is like hosted by the Studio of Creative Inquiry. And for some reason, they want people who aren't in CFA to apply for these grants. So most of you are not in CFA. So you should apply for these grants and get some money. Free money. Yes. So well, no, they make, they want you to do. But basically, well, basically, okay. free uh, basically unconditional because they'll be like, okay, cool project, give me the money. The only thing that's stopping you from, uh, like if you don't submit a project, you still have the money, but you just can't apply for the project. So yeah. Actually free money. <laughs> Exploit. Number two, I, I implore that you take ETC classes. Most of you are too old to take them. But like Steve and and, and uh, Dom and Andy are young and Kai are young. And, and you guys, I think you're also pretty young, right? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> yes. So you should take ETC courses because I eat classes. Are not that good in my opinion. Entertainment Technology Center. So it's like imagine IDA, except they're off except campus. Good. And it's better and it's a grad program. Yeah. Everyone who works there. Neil Druckmann went there. Okay, guys. He's coming to campus. So true. I'm gonna say I love him. So. So, so, so yeah, you can take ETC courses. Here's why. You can you get to make yourself a color ground. They have chair that moves. Oh yeah, the egg pair. The egg chair. The egg chair. So true. They have a thing. <laughs> no, but but I took the photo. <laughs> It's pretty cool. <laughs> they, have, they have something called like they have something called a cavern, which is basically like it's called a cave. No, it's a cavern. It's like a cave, but it's a cylinder. They actually, it's, a, it's an acronym. So now, so, so, so it's a projection onto a cylinder, and like you get to make games. What's the auction house for? <laughs> it was the experience we built on it. I built I built two things on it. I built uh, like a story based and an auction. What are you doing? <laughs> I don't want to do it. I you go to the experience going now. So, so it is be good, okay, in some areas. So, number one, you should associate with labs and do research. They give money and give you office space. Fifteen dollars an hour. Yes, that's more than TA. Whoa. You get access to weird spaces. And you get to do fun bonding activities. And you go on trips for free. <laughs> That's neither of us. <laughs> a friend of mine. You guys couldn't go here. It's not US yes. but, but the reason why I say this that you should you could as a GCS member join a lab. Is that game engine knowledge is important for other people want to utilize the skills you have to make things that are games or maybe even non game related, like. A lot. There look like we'll go on LinkedIn and just like search it on real engine. Why are they only full time? This for you. I mean, <laughs> for the full of for like this. So like you could do internships during semester. Like on me. Yeah, nobody hiring software engineers. <laughs> and then there's this. So you could use Unity and Unreal and maybe Godot. You convince them hard enough for non game related things. And they pay you sweet salary. So it's pretty nice. Yes, Kai. So wait, if it's a grad program, how are you going to grab some of these guys? Bag, you like write email. Like, just be like, hi, you're too fast. Yeah, pretty much. So, so you just have to hold, hold 
hope that when they look at your like application form that they're like, oh, hey, this first qualified for after just hiring. So in the context of like, are you talking about ETC? Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just, you the know, ETC is a is a school. It's a school here. It's, like it's CMU. Yeah. It's a class. You can, if they have classes. You can register. But it's not here. It's like there. down the street. It's, it's not down, down the one way. Way. motherfucker makes it sound like it's that's just down, down the street. Yeah, it's, it's like across the hill, uphill, both ways. <laughs> Come on. There's a shuttle that runs every year. Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> so there's only one class you need to email for, and it's called Building Virtual Worlds, which is what this mod mod yeah. is from. It's, it's pretty good. Um, but there's other courses there that you should also do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. Let's go get food. Oh, yeah, you want, I can send you this. Here's the thing. No, I want you to find this. Oh, oh, sure. It is. Yeah. It should be. It's not there. Good job. Okay, let's go. Oh, for Yes, yes. It's like it's so school of Right. No drama and music have more. Well, you're not really so sad. Oh, oh true. True. Oh. I share my computer. I think you'll just. Oh, I'm still on it. That's good. Come now. He doesn't have the bed. What now? N. Do you have to end oh, to record uh, it? I think I think it'll be like ring. It's it's supposed to email me. I because it's oh, totally yeah. But cloud. do you want to end it? Just it it ends the recording. Uh, do you end? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in charge. Him. Well, because it was recording on you. You are now in charge. Oh wait, I think I, I think it's think. fine. I think if you it's end, up a, it's, I can't. It's like turning off. Yeah. Oh, Fine, I'll, I'll like I'll like go on my phone. <laughs> wait, 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 maybe I am. Maybe. Okay. Hang on, hang on. Open. Yes. Stop. Uh, you will see. Yeah.